Hey everyone, welcome to this webinar hosted by ASE and the ASE Education Foundation. I'm Kelly Tran, as Dave mentioned, Assistant Vice President at ASE. I want to welcome everyone joining us today. We know that all of you are interested in learning as much as you can to help keep your skills sharp. Sometimes a review of fundamental techniques can pay off big when it comes to those skills. That's what today's session is all about. Now joining us live from Ajax, Ontario, Canada is Gordon Rye, Technical Instructor at Exalta Coding System. Gordon is going to provide an in-depth walkthrough of surface preparation, reinforcing its importance to get the job done right. Okay, Gordon, thanks for presenting today. Over to you. Perfect, thank you very much. Let me just minimize my screen here so I can clear this out a bit. All right, there we go, perfect. So thanks everyone for being here, uh, I do appreciate it. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Gordon Rye. Uh, just a little bit about my background before we get started. Uh, I've been a painter for um, 28 years now. Uh, I've worked in uh, the greater Toronto area and um, spent about 21 years in the shop, mostly collision centers. And uh, the past seven years has, has been with Exalta as product specialist and, uh, and training instructor. Um, but what we really want to talk about today in this webinar is we want to cover, like we said uh, earlier, the basics, right? We want to talk about surface preparation because one of the things that's important is you can be the best painter in the world. It doesn't matter if you don't have a, a good surface to start on, whatever you do on top, it really isn't going to matter at the end of the day and it's usually end up in, in, in costly redos. Uh, I was working in a shop yesterday and uh, Unfortunately, they prepped something and, and they used the wrong sanding grit and it was a silver and you could see sand scratches. So, you know, that ended up being a redo just by, by not, you know, following the best practices of surface surface preparation. So let's let's start rolling into this. Let me just click on the screen here. So our agenda for today, what we really want to cover is surface preparation basics. Uh, we want to look at surface cleaning. Cleaning is really important, okay? We do not want any contamination on the surface. You know, even if you're able to paint over contamination, it will work its way up to the surface causing some sort of, uh, of defect. Uh, we're gonna look at some undercoats. Plastic preparation is really important. Uh, I, as I mentioned all the time, I see a lot of cars driving around with the, the paint peeling off the bumpers and, and realistically that shouldn't happen. You know, in any paint system, I know I work for Exalta, but with any paint system used correctly, it, it will work. You know, we should be able to get that paint to stick. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some blend panels and, and best preparation. What's the best practices? And again, I'm always going to be best practices, right? I know some people are going to say, well, I used this grit and that grit and it worked. But but what we're pushing for is, again, best practices. What what can we get the best out of that that uh, that paint job? So surface preparation, it's just various processes we use to just to make a foundation. And, and why we want that really good, strong foundation is we need to protect the metal, okay? If it's aluminum or if it's steel, whatever it is, those are things that are gonna corrode. I know they corrode a little differently, but we need to protect those, right? We wanna prevent rust and corrosion and adhesion, right? Like, like I mentioned earlier, we need to get that paint to stick to the vehicle. We do not want it to come off, okay? And we also need to set it up so we can promote adhesion between different layers. So like, especially on raw plastic, if we start with an adhesion promoter, move to a, uh, a sealer, and then move to a base coat, and then a clear coat. We need to make sure we have all those layers cross-link and, and everything's gonna work. And then we can talk about, you know, do we need to seal the surface? What are we gonna do in, with that, with the, with the sealer? All right, uh, so let's look at some substrate cleaning. This is a little busy on this slide, but realistically, when a, when a customer brings a car to a shop, uh, I always ask them if it's possible, you know, hey, can you run your car through a car wash the night before? You know, don't use any waxes or special treatments on it, but, you know, bring the car in clean. You know, when you drop it off, we can look at the damage. We can, you know, use uh, waterborne markers on the car and we kind of write that, you know, this is previous damage that's not going to be repaired. So it's always nice to have a, a clean car. If they can't wash it, then if it shows up dirty, obviously park it inside out of the sun. Use a, a bucket with some warm water. Warm water is going to get you know, those waxes and greases like tree sap and things like that. that just flowing off the car, right? It's going to be easier to remove. Make sure we use a, a car wash soap. That's body shop friendly. You know, I, I hear a lot of people use dish soap. Most dish soaps have lanolin and that's meant to, you know, make your hands soft. 
and we don't want those you know when we're, when we're cleaning a car getting ready for paint uh, make sure we wet it down and and use a wash mitt or a car wash brush something specific to that that that's you know a proper piece of equipment and and work in small sections from the top down most of your grit and grime as we know is going to be on the bottom of the car so if we bend over and start washing the the rocker panel with a wash mitt we're going to carry a lot of that dirt up into the surface so you know work from the top down and don't let anything dry if it starts to dry maybe soap it up again and rinse it off and then you know once it's done completely rinse it off you can dry it however you want you can use a chamois a blade whatever you need to but dry it off um i like to take an air blower and go around the the like you know moldings and mirrors and door handles and blow out any of that that air or sorry that water that might be trapped in there and when I'm done, we always really push the 5S practice, right? Always clean up after yourself. So when you go to get that item again to use it, it's there. So we'll clean up and 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 move on. So once we've cleaned it, what we need to do at that point is, you know, I don't know if this car has been waxed, what kind of treatments it's had done. So we need to take some cleaner and we need to clean it, okay? So, you know, depending on what paint system you use, just use the appropriate one, uh, like a solvent-based silicone and wax remover. Always remember though, like like mentioned, I'm in Canada. So for us, we kind of have a rule with the government that I can only use a solvent-based cleaner prior to sanding. Once I put a sand scratch on the car, actually has to be water-based cleaner to the end of the repair. There is a stipulation where if we use an aerosol-based solvent cleaner, that's allowable because there's only four ounces of product in those aerosols. So, you know, that that's just a way to get around that. But Always check with the, the regulations on whatever area you're in to make sure you're you're with the, within code. And we always recommend a pump and spray bottle. You know, the days of the technician just having a rag in his hand, his or her hand, and dumping a bunch of product on that, I'd say 80% of it ends up on the ground. So it's wasteful, you're emitting VOCs. So pump and spray bottle is a really good thing to have. Uh, and then work in small areas. But the one thing we wanna do is use two rags. We want to be able to wipe it on and then we want to be able to wipe it off okay if you don't wipe it off a lot of cleaners have heavy detergents in them and if you don't get that detergent off it can become something that will disturb the finish when you go to spray it down okay and especially with waterborne cleaners they have uh, glycol in them and and it's fine to use as long as you remove all the liquid from the surface okay so remember just wet it work in small areas and dry it right away that's the best way to do it. And if the rag gets soiled, you know, you, you can end up spreading contamination. So if it gets really dirty, you know, get a new rag. We don't want to spread that stuff around, okay? And again, like we said earlier, you know, return all items to their, their place. So when you go to get them again, they're there, okay? If you have empty pump and spray bottles, fill them up at that time. So when you go to use them again, it doesn't slow you down. All right. So body repair is another thing. And, and I'm a licensed auto body painter. Uh, in Canada, I don't know if there's there's you know people on the call from from in Can from Canada, but here it's a little different. We have to have an actual license to to do body repairs if you're going to straighten a frame, anything structural. So I'm not that guy. I'm the paint guy, but um, I have done a lot of of repairs where someone has sent me some body repairs, and this is right here a great example of of what some people deal with. Like, and this sand scratch is in your polyester putty, so. This is say where someone's fixed a dent and they've used a little bit of polyester filler and they've sanded it out. And now it goes to say the prep department and they're going to have to you know, start the refinishing feather edging and all that before primer. If we look at the first one, that's P36 grit scratch. So that's four to five mils of, of uh, depth, okay? Like I can't even do anything with that with primer, all right? The next one we move to is P80 grit. Now we leave a scratch that's 1.5 to 2 mils. And yeah, we're getting in the zone that maybe I could put some primer over that. My chance of burning through and exposing the body filler, that's going to be pretty good at that point. But if I just, or the technician, because again, I'm not the body guy, but if the technician just moves up to P180 grit, now you're going to leave a sand scratch that's 0.75 to 1.25 mils that is going to leave a lot of primer on top and it's just not going to soak up all my primer so it's going to leave me the best repair possible and i don't know about other paint companies but our guidelines with exalta is we should have two to three mils of dry film thickness over top of polyester filler that's going to give us the longest 
uh, a holdout for that repair. And if we think about it, and I'm just picking one one product, for example, uh, one of the primers I'm, I'm familiar with, realistically, we're going to spray, I don't know, six or seven mils wet. If we do six mils wet, that primer has a solid content of 47%. So what that means is 53% of those six mils, for example, is actually gonna evaporate during the drying process. So I'm left with half. So I'm left with, out of six mils, I'm left with three. All right, so if I've got a, a two mil scratch depth, I, I'm left with maybe a mil over top of my primer. So that's really what people don't think about. So we, we really need to be aware of that. And reading the technical data sheets, very, very important because it actually spells all that out to you on those sheets. So whatever paint system you're using, go to their website, you know, their technical data sheets, you can download them, you can view them. Um, I highly, highly recommend reading them. They're very, very helpful. But this is a great example, this this slide here. In the center, you see the little blue arrow and you see on that that panel, you can see this the, the sand scratches where, you know, they're a little too deep and the primer has sunk down a little in the paint and the clear. And, and now that's exposed. Could I wet sand and polish that? I might be able to and make it disappear. I might burn through. So again, that might be a redo. And that's not something you want to hand the customer or have them come back like, you know, two weeks later and say, hey, this, this kind of looks funny on my car now after you repaired it. So how do we avoid that? And these are great examples here. So, you know, number one here, so diagram number one, that's basically showing I don't know, I'm gonna say a 36 grit scratch, for example, okay? It's very deep and there's air within that scratch. If I look at example two, what we've done is we've done our feather edging and our sanding and cleaning, and then we've put primer over top of that. And by putting primer over top of that in, in diagram two, is we've actually compressed that air down. And now that air is actually holding up some of that primer and not letting it get to the bottom. And everybody says, hey, you know, how much can air hold up? We always use this in our class as an example. Well, your car has four wheels on it and, and I don't know how many PSI are in each wheel, but they're holding up average two to 3000 pounds of weight. So compressed air can hold a lot of weight. So when we go to diagram three, what happens is we've sanded our primer, we've taken it in the booth, we've sprayed it, and that air is still trapped under there. In diagram four, as time goes on, that air will migrate to the surface. It will not stay down there. And that also is the same with solvents. So if you, you know, if you prime it too quickly between coats and you trap some solvent in there, it will do pretty much the same thing. So now once that air evaporates in diagram five, there's nothing there to hold it up. So down goes the finish, right? So that's where we get those marks. So just by taking a little extra time and putting a smoother, more refined scratch on your body repair, you're gonna have a more resilient finish that's gonna last longer, less sinkage, and it's just gonna look better all around, okay? Let's talk a little bit about feather edging. Uh, when we feather edge, you know, and, and I don't know how many technicians on here are, you know, in the body industry, so I'm just gonna elaborate a little more, is feather edging is what we wanna do to the edge of a, where we've ground down the paint to do a body repair. We need to smooth back all the different layers to have a very gradual taper to prime on to help, you know, straighten everything out and make it look just perfect. So what we want is three eighths, which, you know, equals about 10 millimeters between layers. And you're gonna see the E-coat, which is the black, surface there and you can see where it's burned through to a bit of the metal or aluminum whatever it may be and the next darker gray one is is our oe sealer so they use a sealer or or sometimes they'll call it like a primer sealer at the factory and then we go with our top coat so we're looking for probably about 10 millimeters from from your e coat to your sealer you're probably not going to get 10 mils because most e coat is like 0.4 to 0.6 mils in in film thickness so it's not, you know, that's you're gonna have a hard time there, but as long as your other layers are pushed back, and really what we wanna do is if we're feather edging, we wanna work in towards the repair. So, you know, instead of feather edging and working outward like this, what we wanna do is take our sander and work inward towards the body repair, and that's gonna help us, okay? And obviously, if we are gonna put a solvent-based product over top, our base coat that's there, is our most sensitive area because usually it's not catalyzed. It doesn't have a hardener in it, okay? 
So this is where we're going to have a poll question. So, so let's open up the polls. Once that's opened up, I'll read the question. All right, there we go. Let me just see this. So our first question is, when preparing a repaired panel, which grit of sandpaper should be used on the feather edge to remove 320 grit scratches? And we didn't really discuss this. So your answers are A, P400, B, P600, C, P1000, or D, uh, P1500. So just take a good guess at it and, and let's see how many of the, uh, the, the polls we can get, how many people can answer. Hey, Gordon. Yep. Dan here. Um, while we're waiting for them to respond for the poll, Michael asked a question about uh, using clay or a clay bar during the pre-repair process of cleaning the vehicle, asking if that's uh, a preferred or appropriate way. Absolutely. If, if you see that you've got some industrial fallout, so, you know, little rust specks that you can see in the surface if you park near a rail yard, that's totally acceptable. Just make sure whatever liquid you're using to, to help get the, reduce the friction for the clay bar, just make sure it's cleaned off well. We used to use uh, towels soaked in like a muriatic acid, and that was one thing we did years ago, but absolutely go ahead and use that. All right. And then uh, Guillermo asked if it's possible to prep and then paint on top of chrome. That's a tricky one. Um, chrome, I don't think we can get anything to stick to it. It would either have to be sandblasted or ground off to expose the metal, or you, if you could have it chemically stripped like at a chroming facility, those would be your best. Uh, if people don't want to go to that extent, what I recommend is just have it wrapped, if, if as long as it's not too crazy of a color. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm not seeing where my polls are open here. How, how long has it been on the poll? Because we could probably close it now. It's been two minutes. I'll go ahead and close it out. Okay, yeah, I'm just not seeing it. I don't know what's uh, what my deal is with the poll. I'm just not seeing the poll questions right here. Um, what was the the uh the answer with that one there we go okay perfect thank you there's the results uh yeah that's it p600 would be our preferred uh you could try p400 that will help refine the the 320 but p600 would give us the best p1000 that's usually what we use in a blend panel so you know it, it's just not a 1000 grit paper won't cut out um, a 320 scratch. So we just have to be aware that we've jumped a little too far and, and we'd struggle getting those scratches out. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to undercoats. So there's three main products that we use in let's say the collision side of it. And on the, the um, restoration side, there's an epoxy primer sealer that's used. It's a little different, but on the collision side, it, it's a little slower, but um, we typically use an etch primer and and it can be like um like a khaki um, that we can use that uh, typically what it is and, and that's for our bare metal and it also works for you know aluminum as well uh it, it gives us our corrosion protection and it gives that bite and it's a low film build we can't fix stuff with etch primer if there's scratches that's just a treatment, right? We need the primer on top of that. And it contains acid. And what it does, like I said, it gives us our adhesion and our corrosion protection on that panel. So um, one of the things with Ford aluminum and other aluminum uh, I, I, uh, repairs, I mentioned earlier that some people use epoxy. Epoxy is a little more popular in the collision side now with aluminum because you know we do recommend over aluminum to put an epoxy down before you do body repairs. So that's where that might come into a collision center. Um, but the next product we use is really is a primer filler, all right? That's something we use to sand and we isolate, you know, sometimes old paint, but mainly it's for, for polyester, right? If we do a body repair and it's sent over and it's got some filler in it, you know, or, or even like say plastic's been ground down to take out some small abrasions or something, we're going to use a, um, a primer filler over top of that. But we also have some abilities to use different types of primer fillers that are, so usually we'll have a white and a gray and a black or just a white and a black. And we can intermix those to get different gray shades. So if you're doing a white 
vehicle with a, a, a repair, why put a dark gray primer over it? Because now you have to spend more money on base coat to cover that dark gray. If you used a white primer, now you're going to put less base coat. You're going to be more profitable at, at the end of the day. You're going to have a little more money in your pocket, let's say, from that repair. Um, durability of top coat, like I said, we should have two to three mils of primer. So if you see that someone's burned through everywhere on their primer and body fillers showing up, that really should be reprimed again. You know, that's, that's again, best practice. And that also gives us our adhesion because we sanded it. And that sand scratch now becomes mechanical adhesion. It's something for the paint to bite to. All right. And it also gives us our smooth imperfection-free surface. And it's a two-component product. So it has a catalyst in it. And, and that catalyst, you know, forces the cross link and it dries and it won't dissolve again. All right. So sealer is the next one. Uh, when we're doing using a sealer, that's a wet on wet process. And what we mean by wet on wet is we'll spray our sealer and I'm not going to sand anything. Okay, sealer is really just a thin down version of a primer filler, and we use a reactive reducer that helps kick it over really fast. So I spray my sealer. Uh, our average is 20 minutes and of flash time, so we wait 20 minutes, and then we can go right to base coat and, and then clear or use a single stage over top. All right, we can sand it if there's any little dust nibs in it or imperfections that we see, but again, it gives us our uniform colored uh, substrate, promotes adhesion. The isolation of polyester is kind of, you know, a better process to me would be reprime. Uh, it does isolate old paint, which is a great thing is say you have a pickup truck that you're putting a used door on and the truck is white, the door shows up red. You really, you know, you, you, you order used parts, it's kind of hard to pick the right color. So rather than just sanding it and spraying it white with a whole bunch of base coat, we could put a coat of sealer inside and out that's white. And sealer is much cheaper than base coat. So, you know, that's going to help us there. And again, gives us good adhesion for our top coat. And it, it really provides a uniform surface to start painting over. All right, let's just click on here. All right, so now we're going to jump to another poll question. So if we can open up the polls. Let me open up my side window so I can see everything. You should here. be able to see it now, Gordon. Ah, uh, yes, I can. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, all of these uh, are reasons to use an etch primer on bare metal except one. So which is the one? Uh, it provides adhesion. So that's A is provide adhesion for an undercoat, prevents corrosion is B, C is provides adhesion to the base coat, or D is protects bare metal. So which one of those isn't the one we're looking for? Gordon. Yes. <clears throat> Can I interrupt you for more than I already have about, I've got a couple of questions in the pain Absolutely. here that I'd like to bounce off you. Um, so uh, Dwight asks, what grit should we use on bare automotive sheet metal prior to applying primer or sealer? Okay, so an oh, like an OE part, like a brand new one? Let's go with that. Okay, so you're stealing a bit of my thunder because I am going to get there, but we want to use the the least amount of grit that we can so go with the finest grit you can because that 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 oee coat is really important to leave behind and not burn through it okay we actually have a sealer in our lineup in Spies hacker that we don't want you to sand it if it's perfect and there's no damage on the e coat wash it seal it only all right just to keep that surface but just do as as little as you can or look at the paint system that you're using, whatever brand it is, and read the TDS for that sealer that you're gonna use, because it will give you your, your grit requirements. But I always go with the least I can go. Hopefully that answers your question. And Sherman, Sherman uh, who is working in a facility in Florida and mm -hmm. asks, how much does humidity play into the prep uh, process? Humidity is a problem in everything we do. It's gonna slow us down. Uh, it can cause all kinds of problems. So typically the main problem with humidity in, in prep is, you know, maybe getting on your primer a little too quickly between your layers of application, but it's more in the, in, say, in the spray booth where you're spraying a waterborne base coat, because most shops now are spraying waterborne base coats. It's really slowing them down uh, and it can prevent some, or, or cause, sorry, not prevent, cause some blushing at the end, right, in, in the material, because you've trapped some moisture in the layers. 
Uh, but humidity on the prep side, and, and I just, just thought of this, is exposed metal can start to corrode in, I don't know, I think it's 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the t uh, how much humidity is in the air. So if you say, and like the other question was, what grit do I say in that, that, that new e-coat with? So say you buzz down a fender with P400 grit and you expose all kinds of bare metal, if it doesn't get painted right away or sealed right away, it can start the corrosion process fairly quickly. If it's bare aluminum, I've been told, we've done studies that it's pretty much instantly, there's a chemical reaction where that moisture is causing that aluminum to start to, to corrode a bit. So that's your main thing, come to think of it, is, is just getting that aluminum and those metals protected as soon as possible if it's on the prep side. All right, so we might as well go ahead and close okay. the, the poles. Is there any other questions? That's good. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, all right, looks like 52% provides adhesion between uh, uh, for, to the base coat. And that is, well, it's the right answer for the question. But yeah, I'll be, absolutely, we don't want to use an um, etch under base coat. So, so good job, everyone. That's, uh, that's what we are looking for. All right, I'm just going to click back on my screen. And we are going to look at the next slide. So this in the lower right corner is um, is a door that's been repaired, it looks like. And then we have a fender next to it that's a blend panel. OK, so what the main thing we need to do is inspect that body job first, right? And you know, it's not that we want to nitpick at people, but we just don't want to slow down the process. And the shop I was in the other day, they they just weren't doing this. And, and then when we get through the prep pr uh, process where it's primed and blocked, we start noticing deficiencies where so we take a little time look for pinholes in the body filler where you've had a little air entrapment and then it's been sanded through and exposes a little bubble you know look at look for those look for deep scratches that that maybe are you know that aren't 180 and your primer's not going to fill so if you have a few little pinholes yeah I'll, I'll fill them myself I'll use a little two component uh, glaze I really like to stay away from those putties in a tube and most of you that are in the industry know what they are just lacquer putty they'll shrink eventually, so they're not the best. If you can use a 2K putty, use it. Something with a catalyst is gonna be the best. But if it's not good enough, send it back. It's cheaper to send it back and have it done than it is to try and push it through the system and repaint it later, okay? So if we do have some some uh, minor pinholes, like I said, use a, a 2K glaze, You know, spread it on, scrape it off. I like to take a little bit of sandpaper and a block, maybe just scuff the edges, just make sure it's smooth again. Uh, what we need to do though is take some 180 grit and where those lines are you can see in the top and in the front of that panel we need to feather those back i would put some tape on that fender to protect it from sand scratches it's a nice clean panel for blending i'm just going to you know make sure i don't scratch it all up and we need to start with 180 for our initial sanding and then once we've got our feather edge back and again we try and get 10 millimeters or three eighths of an inch on all the different layers then i'm going to go to to 320 and I'm going to try and cut all those 180 scratches out all right and that's that's going to um, uh, just be the best overall for what we can do in that repair all right so now at that point we can change to 600 grit and then we can start cutting out the 320 and we can back sand a little further on the panel with 600 grit so our overspray from our primer will bite in and and has something to stick to worst thing we can do is spray primer over it and actually go past our sand scratch and onto unsanded product. That will that will have a, a adverse uh, effect when we're done, right? If it's not sanded off or cleaned off. At this time, I can say, you know what? Hey, I'm sanding, I'm dusty, let's do the blend panel. So at that point, what we can do is take a gold scotch pad and, and uh, people always tell me, and again, I'm best practice all the way. So people say, hey, I use a gray scotch pad and it seems to work. Does it work? Yeah, you know what, I, I know people that do it every day, but could we do a better job? Yeah, we could do a better job and we could use gold. So if we look at scotch pads, uh, a gold is 800 to 1000, uh, gray is uh, what, P500, P600, and red is P320 to P400 equivalency. So um, let's use the, the gold in those areas. And we always like to get the edges first with our gold scotch pad. So then I don't have to push that dual action sander with P1000 too close to my edge and cause a burn through, all right? Then we wanna clean our surface and then apply etch primer as we would. And it's usually one coat and then there's a flash. And then at that point we would, you know, return all our items to, to uh, its normal place. And then we would add our primer filler uh, at the same time. 
Okay, so this is just an example of a feather edge, and you can see they've you know they've went 320, then they've gone 600, and and they've gone back a little further on that panel. Uh, I personally would like to see it a little further than that, but that works for me. Uh, what we want to say is don't jump more than two grades when feather edging, right? So if you started with 80, which is a little aggressive, you go to 180, you want to go to 320, right? If you went to say 600 from 320, uh, it might be a bit of a problem, but in this case, we're going to put primer over that. So uh, cleaning up your feather edge with 600 is, is okay, because there, again, there is going to be primer over it. All right, so there's our bare metal, our little bit of body filler, everything's feather edge. We want to make sure we clean it before we put primer. Just blowing it off with air is not good enough. Let's take some cleaner and clean that off. And then what we're going to do now is uh, use our etch primer. All right, whatever your, your system calls for, use that product. Just make sure you're mixing it correctly and, and make sure you're following the flash times, all right, as recommended by the TDS of your product. It's really important because these products always work. It's us, you know, and, and again, I, I'm all, I have 28 years of spray and I can look back and I can pretty much blame any mistakes on myself, right? I just didn't follow the flash time. I was in a hurry, you know, that's my excuse, but. Uh, if something blows up on you, it's usually us pushing it a little too hard. So in this case, if you're using our product 22880, it would be a 15 minute flash time. All right. So once we get that on there, try not to soak the body filler. You're going to get some overspray on the body filler. That's okay. But just try not to just, you know, soak it. So this one example now, we've waited our 15 minute flash and we've made our, our primer filler. And, and we're going to do it in, in three coats is what our system recommends. But as you can see, the first coat on this one is very wide. That's the darkest gray. Okay. So we've gone really wide first. And now the second coat is after an eight to 10 minute flash, we're kind of stepping in a little bit. And then after eight to 10 minute flash again, we're going to step back in even further. So that last coat really ends up over your repair. Okay. And that's our outside in technique. And it doesn't matter whose primer you're using and what paint company, that's the best application, okay? And we're gonna discuss a little bit in, in the next slide or two on why that's the best application. All right, so after that's dry, you've either baked it or used an infrared lamp or let it sit for two, three hours overnight possibly. Um, we should always use guide coat, all right? Guide coat is, um, is just graphite powder. And what that does is goes down into all the imperfections. And when you start to sand them, it makes them visible. Okay, so then we can identify defects before we get them in the booth. So this is your inside out, okay? This is what most people do um, when, when, when you go to prime. And if you look at the picture, the light gray down in the lower right corner, that's our first coat of primer. And you can see the little bumps, that's kind of your dry over spray edge, okay? So we spray that, we create a little ring of primer uh, dry spray around it. We give it eight to 10 minutes, we spray the next one, which is a little bit darker gray picture. And we've done a little blow up there to show you that now that that primer overspray got a little thicker and what's happening is the viscosity is changing. As that catalyst is starting to react with the temperature and the reducer, it's starting to thicken a little bit, okay? So what happens now is as it gets thicker, when I put the final coat, which is the darkest gray, I'm not allowing any, you know, any primer to actually make it to the substrate over top of that overspray. So that's poor adhesion. And if I do knock the surface off and I expose some of that dry texture, I could possibly show up my paint job as well as, as like a halo is something we like to call it, okay? So that's not the greatest way to do it. Again, we always have a way that we can do it better. Um, this is really how we, we recommend to do it. So the darkest gray, we're gonna do it in reverse here. The darkest gray is gonna be our first coat, okay? We leave our overspray on the outside now. Then we're gonna do the next coat, which again, leaves the overspray on the next on the outside. And you can see that the droplets are starting to get bigger. The primer's starting to thicken up. And then now the third coat, our droplets stay on the outside. So I'm gonna back up one slide. On this slide here, our thickest edge of primer is on the outside, and that's shown by our droplets, right? Those are our biggest droplets, okay? That's gonna be hard to sand out. You're gonna burn through. It's it's just, you, you know, if it's a black vehicle that you're painting, having the right angle, you could see that distortion. If we do it this way, our thinnest edge 
is on the outside and our thickest film build now is on the inside where our repair is, where we need it to be. Okay, so doing outside in has so many benefits. All right, um, I wanna make sure we keep on time here. Uh, it's Friday afternoon, I know, so let's open up the polls again for another poll question. All right, so this one here, primer surfacer should be applied using the inside out technique, a spray gun with a 1.4 millimeter tip, the outside in technique, or back to back technique, meaning just spray a coat, wait like two seconds and spray another one. So we'll give it just a minute on this one. I know we're getting close for time. Hey, Gordon. Yes. Um, David asks, if you're blending within a panel, do you still use sealer? If you're blending within a panel, well, that's that's, that's a fairly open question. So for me, if I've got a primer repair spot done in the middle of that panel, let's say, as long as I've sanded that primer with, I don't know, P500, P600 grit paper, and then done my blend with, say, a 1,000 and gold scotch pad, I try not to spot seal. I try and stay away from sealer as much as possible, unless it's a new panel, you know, a new bumper cover, or say a, a used panel that's a different color. I know a lot of people spot seal, but the question you're asking is that, you know, if you put that sealer on now, what's happened is you're, you know, and you're trying to do an in panel blend, you're gonna eat up some of your blend room, right? And so now that smaller repair that you can try and make now becomes bigger and bigger, and it adds cost to the job as well. So you know, depending on what paint system you have, if they require certain gray shades or your colored primers underneath, always try and get the primer to the point you don't have to seal it, all right? The least amount of time we can spend in the booth, the better. All right, hopefully that answers your question. Again, Thank my you. email address will be at the end. I'll leave that slide up for a bit. You guys can reach out to me. Anybody that has questions, um, you know, send me a message. So let's close the polls. And... So we had 67% said the outside in technique. That is fantastic. That is what we're looking for. All right. Uh, let's keep moving on. I know I'm running a touch late here. All right. So let's talk about sealer. And that, that's actually just what we're talking about. So um, when we seal a panel, one thing we want to do is, is solvent test it. And there's solvent testing E-coat, which E-coat is usually solvent resistant. If it's not, you've kind of got a big problem. So typically what we like to do is rub... Uh, some solvent on it for a couple minutes, you know, see if it's gonna, you know, soften up that surface. If so, then maybe we gotta look at removing that surface. But um, one thing we wanna do on a new e-coated panel is inspect it for damage, right? If there's damage on it, send it back to body, you know, have it fixed. If it's too bad, we might wanna think about sending the panel back. And, and like I said earlier, use the finest grit sandpaper that you can to remove imperfections. That e-coat was put on in a controlled environment. And typically what it is, is, it, you know, I work within Ford and Chrysler uh, here in Ontario. I actually get to work with the Ford GT program. It's about 30 minutes from my training center, which is really cool. Um, but the car is dipped. It's submerged in an e-coat bath. And usually I think it's the car is negative, the fluid is positive, and it's drawn in there. So there's no air in the equation when the e-coat's being applied. So that dipping method is the best thing to leave on there on that, that e-coat because it's been dipped. It's, it's going to last the longest, okay? Um, and then if you do have to do a repair on a new panel, make sure we spot prime it and then clean everything up. And then at that time, I'd seal it. So if you do sand out, say, a box mark where it rubbed a little in the box and went through the e-coat, sand it out with this, you know, find a grid as you can, put an etch over it, and then just move on to the sealer stage. Okay, so this is something that, you know, a lot of people I see out on the road is cars driving around with all the, the base and clear peeling off the hood, all right? E-coat protects the panel from UV exposure. Even though we spray black paint, red paint, blue paint, doesn't matter. When we spray it on the surface, it's not 100% covered, okay? Even though visually to us, it looks covered. And then we dry the base and we clear coat it. If that clear coat, or sorry, the UV can penetrate the clear coat and it will get through the base coat as well. When it comes to the, the, uh, the E coat, what happens, it breaks it down and it loses its ability to hold on to the base coat. 
Okay, so so now we end up with all that base coat peeling off the, the panel. So if we just take that step of adding sealer, then go to base and clear, that sealer step just helps isolate that panel from any UV penetrating the, the film and breaking down the surface, okay? It's also gonna minimize chipping. It's got a lot more film build, which helps, you know, the thicker the film, the, the, the better and more chip resistant it is, okay? And, it, and again, it helps us with coverage. If it's a white hood and we put white sealer down, we use less white base coat, okay? And again, I will say, always look at the TDS. Whatever system you're spraying, it will be recommended what to do. All right, so sealer application. Determine how much you need, you know, verify, you know, the, the undercoat formula. Um, ColorNet is the, the system we use with Exalta for mixing. Um, you know, mix it on the scale. Everything like primer, sealer, base clear, we always want to mix them over the scale. It's more accurate, okay? And again, we can always have the computer track your VOC usage and everything. So when the government asks like, hey, let's see your VOC for the year, it's already in there. So mixing over the scale is really important, okay? So make sure we stir them. You know, don't rely on just kind of throwing all the components into a cup and walk away, giving it a shake. Uh, that's not going to mix them well enough. So make sure we give it a really good stir and then use the appropriate spray gun. OK, um, again, your TDS will tell you what, you know, HVLP, what compliance spray gun, what tip size, what air pressure. So it's always a good good thing to look back at the TDS. Clean the surface, OK, before we seal it, make sure we clean it. And again, look at your regulations and what environment you're in. Check the masking paper, make sure it's secure. Last thing you want to do is tape off your door and you, uh, to seal a new fender and then you get sealer blowing all under the the paper and leaves an edge on your door that you got to deal with, okay? Then apply your sealer according to TDS and give it the flash time. Again, that's the most important part, okay? We've got a new waterborne sealer that you can really much, pretty much just spray on, take an air blower, blow it dry and go right to base coat. So the technology is really advancing, but always check at what your TDS recommends for flash time because that's going to make sure that that product lasts, stays shiny, and doesn't die back. And then again, make sure we we clean everything up. So let's throw out another poll question here. All right, so what one are we on? Number four now. So how is the solvent test done? Pour solvent onto the surface and see what happens. Rub a rag soaked with solvent on the surface for 30 seconds. Rub a rag soaked with solvent for a minute or pour sol or put solvent onto the surface and rub it with a scuff pad. What is our best answer there? Now we're gonna give this one one minute and we'll close the polls. What time do we have here? Oh, it's 4.45. Gordon, uh, yes. there was a question related to, a few questions related to solvent asking uh, what the definition of solvent is. The definition of a solvent. So depending on what it is, solvent can be anything from equipment cleaning, lacquer thinner, like a gun wash, or in a primer, we use what we call a reducer, or in clear coats, we use reducers, which is just a different type of solvent, all right? Like, I'm not a, a chemist on my end, but, you know, solvent can be so many different things, unfortunately. So, um, Thank you. yeah, that I hope that answers it, um, but uh, I could get into the the health requirements of solvent and what categorizes it, but I'm not gonna go there today. Sorry, so let's close the poll. Uh, I look like we've, uh, so 49% said rub uh, on the surface uh, for 30 seconds. Yeah, that's not bad, but we could be a little better. We could go a minute. So um, I, I'd say a minute would be the best, right? Let's just give it a minute and rub it there and see if it works, uh, see, if it's, uh, see if it comes off or not. All right, let's keep rolling here. So plastics. So clean and scrub with a gray or even a gold scotch pad. I've had some soft plastic bumpers where a gray scotch pad actually left some deep gouges. So uh, I always like to check that, but we have a cleaning paste and every paint system is gonna have something a little different, okay? So as far as Exalta goes, we have our 265, which is a universal cleaning paste. Uh, it's green, it has a chemical that helps remove the mold release agent from the surface of, of the plastic and it has an abrasive in it that helps scrub it along with the scotch pad. The only thing is you can't let it dry on the surface, okay? 
any of those pastes, just don't let them dry. If they dry, grab a scotch pad and water again and, and scuff them up. Rinse it off. I like to clean it twice, all right? I don't mind. It takes five minutes to scrub a bumper down. It takes two hours to strip the paint off and just to get it ready for a repaint. So um, I'll do it twice. If it feels still a little greasy, and for those of you who worked on greasy, you know, plastic bumpers, you know what I'm talking about, I'll scrub it a third time if I have to. It's like I said, five minutes compared to two hours later in a redo, uh, that's money well spent or time well spent. Uh, once it's dry though, and, and you're in the booth and you're ready, we can go right to adhesion promoter. We don't need an, a cleaner in between these steps. Okay, so this plastic cleaner will just take you right from cleaning it, blow it dry, you can go right to adhesion promoter. Make sure we give a little bit of flash time specified by whatever product you're using for adhesion promoter, and then go to sealer again, in, and then your flash time, then we're gonna go with, with color and clear coat, okay? Um, bumpers, just like we did on the hood, check for reversibility. A lot of the aftermarket bumpers, they'll come with a water-based primer, which on the back, and unfortunately, they say you can sand and paint right over it. Our recommendation is to remove it. If you can take a rag with solvent and wipe it and that color comes off on the rag, that's a reversible product, meaning that it doesn't have a hardener in it. Okay, so that's going to be the weak link. If you leave that on there and you get some stone chips and someone hits it really hard with a pressure washer and it gets in underneath that chip, it is going to take that paint off. So it's safer just to remove it. Okay. Um, if it's good and the primer doesn't, you know, come off, sand it with 600 and then, you know, seal it. If you do burn through to a bit of plastic that when you're sanding and it shows some raw plastic, you know, give it a shot of adhesion promoter in those areas. And then we go with sealer and through the steps like we talked about and, and end up at color. Okay. Um, if we have a plastic repair, so in this picture, we have a bumper that, that someone's done a repair from, say, like a dent or, or something in it. Always check it, like like we said earlier with that fender and the door combo, is just inspect the bodywork, you know, take some air, blow it off, look for, for uh, perfections, imperfections, and, and then feather edge it with 320 or finer, back sand with say P600, use the proper cleaners. Um, plastics are difficult for those of you who have worked on them. You can feel the static, you can see the little hairs on your arm standing up when you get too close to that bumper. You need a cleaner that's designed for plastics because if a static spark jumps and you've got wet cleaner on that surface and it has a very low flash point, it will ignite, all right? And you probably end up losing your eyebrows. So, so we need to be careful with that. We have specific plastic cleaners that have a very high flash point. So these little static discharges don't ignite them. So just make sure we're careful there. Again, we're gonna use the surfacer on that, so a primer filler, and we're gonna make sure we have a flexible additive in it, okay? And, and then again, outside in process and dry it. However, you can let it sit overnight. You can bake it in the booth. You can use an infrared light, whatever it may be, and then sand it out using your guide coat and then just go through the steps like we talked about, okay? All right, last poll question. So let's open that up here. What is the part number of the new Exalta plastic cleaning paste? Is it A2310S, B7871, C 265, or D 200? So let's see who is paying attention. Now it looks like a lot of people were paying attention. That's good. All right, so we're gonna give this one just one minute because I don't want to take any more of your time on a Friday afternoon. All right, we're almost halfway through. We've only got 20, 30% oh, of the people. So come on, let's see if we can get up to 100% of people um, hitting that button. All right, that's a good jump. We're up to 42 now. All right, we're down to our last 10 seconds. So if you haven't... Uh, Put in an answer, throw one in. If you don't know the answer, just pick one anyway. So you've got a, a good chance you might get it right. All right, so let's close the polls, see what we have here. All right, so 50% said 265. That is the one. Perfect. So that is our new one. And for those of you who went 2310S, uh, uh, that was our old part number. So that tells me there's a lot of uh, old Exalta users here. So um you know that was the old one the new one now is is kind of a trick question is 265 is the new one but 
you know, I feel bad. You really weren't wrong because that is uh, uh, one of the old numbers. So I'll give you half points for that one. All right, so let's talk about blend preparation. And this is important, okay? We talk about the refractive index. And, and if you talk technically, it, the definition is the measure of the speed at which light travels within a medium. The medium is your clear coat, okay? Clear coat degrades. And, and just sanding it doesn't help, okay? So this is a great example. Uh, this headlight was pulled out of a scrapyard. They taped off the one side that says 1,000 grit, and then they polished the other one first up to a really nice mirror finish, unmasked it, cleaned it, and they sanded the whole headlight with 1,000. They put two coats of clear on it, and the area that didn't get pre-polished, it's, it's all fuzzy looking, right? So what happened was that now scattered the light. It didn't allow it to come back to you in in like, uh, you know, the light reflects right from the sun through the clear and back to the observer again. So it scattered the light. It took too long for that light to get to the substrate and back out again. So it gave us a darker appearance. So the example below it, if that's say a new fender and you're gonna blend that door, before you do any prep work, what we recommend is clean everything first. That's, that should be a given. But I like to polish the last four to six inches of my blend panel where it meets the adjacent panel. And then I clean it with some water-based cleaner. And you don't have to make sure it's a perfect mirror finish. I usually take a wool pad with some number one and step my way through a couple different compounds and I'm done. I don't spend a lot of time. But what I'm doing is I'm enhancing the image of that clear coat on how it reflects light. Okay, so you know a great example is if, you, if you're flying in or out of an airport, you look down to the swimming pool, the deep end is dark, the shallow end is light. So that tells me exactly, it, it just backs up what I'm saying here. The deep end, the light takes a lot longer to go to the bottom and come back out to you as the observer, so it gives a darker appearance. So on those silver cars, those light beige or champagne metallics, that's where it's really important. If you're painting Chrysler PXR, which is a, a black metallic, are you gonna see a darkening of an edge? Probably not, but on those light sensitive colors, it's really gonna help. So use P1000 or finer when you're sanding gold scotch pad too. But this is just a little trick that that's it's kind of I've had problems with it in the past and and I learned how to correct it and this really is the way to correct it. Uh, if we look at our blend preparation, how do we get a panel ready? So this is an in-panel blend and we had a question about that earlier. If I can get that primer sanded in P500, P600, I'm just going to skip sealer altogether. If I don't have to put it on, I'm not doing it because it takes time, it takes money, material. I'm going to go right to base coat. So what I'm gonna do is take a gold scotch pad. I'm gonna get all my edges. Obviously we would have removed the door handle in the mirror and had it all taped up. Uh, then what I'm gonna do is after the, the gold scotch pad is done on my, all my edges, I'm gonna take a dual action sander with P1000 and just get the rest of it, okay? So the primed area is P500, P600, gold on the edges, and then P1000 in the middle, okay? And always remember that the heavier and more coarse the scratch, the more time light takes to get to the bottom of that scratch and back out to you as the observer. So we can end up with this problem again, where we have a little darker on one edge. So P1000 is the, the ideal scratch to use on that, okay? All right, so I'd like to thank everybody for being here. This is my email address. Um, please feel free to reach out to me at any time with any questions. Uh, if, if there were any questions, we can take a couple minutes and answer those. No, Dan, you got a few there you can queue up or no? Sure do, Dave. Oh, that's Gordon. good. Yes. Um, one of the gentlemen's Ross, he asks, uh, what would Exalta consider the definition of a break point uh, for the paint? Uh, he's considering the warranty applications for paint surfaces. Yeah, good question. So a break point is something like a, the newer cars, like when I started painting, you know, the quarter panels all rolled into the roof. And, you know, now we have those break points where we have a molding. We would consider that somewhere where we can tape a hard line and and have like, you know, our break point, right? Like, um, I guess the greatest example is someone paints a quarter panel, but they don't want to go up over the A pillar and, and down to by the windshield. So they try and clear blend it up the A or the C, well, it depends, I guess, would be C pillar. Um, 
that's so so realistically to answer the question it's it's anywhere you can tape an edge and where say it rolls under to uh an ad adjacent panel but um yeah warranty standards on exalta is you have to go right to an edge is uh, hopefully that answered the question J jeremy asks uh and there's a couple questions here related to this, but what is the best way to remove e-coat from a plastic bumper uh, if it's not catalyzed e-coat? Have to have a safe, again, a plastic cleaner that is for plastics, right? With something with a different flash point and you have to physically just soak it with that cleaner, get some, you know, respirator, some eye protection and some gloves and, and just strip it off with a solvent. All right, like if you grab like a regular um like just gun wash or something like that you run the risk of a static discharge and having a flash fire so um i know bloomco there was a company called bloomco that made a specific chemical just to strip that that water-based primer off so that's something they can look into the company was called bloomco uh, and i don't know what the product number is but that's a good question because nobody wants to strip primer off a bumper especially like a like a reversible primer it takes a lot of time it smells you've got big heavy gloves respirator on um i i always push back and say hey you know can we get an oe bumper or can they price match so we don't have to do this all right like let's start with a little better foundation hopefully that answers that Yes, well done. And then uh, related to that same deal about uh, plastic bumper, uh, yep. is it necessary to use a flex additive in the clear coat when spraying on a plastic bumper? That's from Roosevelt. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, anything that's flexible is going to move. When So let, I'm just going to start right from the beginning. If we do a flexible bumper repair, say it had some damage, and they use like the plastic repair kit, that, that repair is now flexible. If I put a primer filler, again, that has to be flexible. It has to be able to move with it. Base coat, very low film builds with base coat, especially waterborne. You're in the 0.8 to 1 mil thickness on average base coat. That's naturally flexible, okay? So when we go to a clear coat, now we're in the 2 to 2.4 mil range. We need that flexibility, okay? So um, everything along that, even the sealer, if you have to seal it, they all need to be flexible. Because if you back into, say, a you know, a curb or something like that, and or here where I am in the winter, you know, it's minus 42 Celsius and you back into a snowbank. If everything bends except the clear coat, you're going to see like what I call spider cracks through it. You're going to see all these little, uh, um, little cracks show up in the clear coat. So we can prevent that by putting a flex additive. And I'm a big fan of flex additive because it's also like a retardant, right? It slows down your dry and it can help your, your distinction of image, so your gloss level. It can end up giving you a little better gloss level. So if I have a new bumper and I'm also going to paint a front end, I'm not going to make two different clear coats, one flexible, one not. I'm just going to flex the whole batch. So like I said, it's, it's okay to have flexible clear on a rigid surface, but it's not okay. Like you have to have flexible uh, uh, clear coat on a flexible surface. So uh, hopefully that answers this question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gordon. Uh, appreciate it. You did a fantastic job. I'm going to pass this over to Dave Cappert. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. All right. Thanks there, Dan. <clears throat> thanks to Gordon Ryan from Exalta Coding Systems for today's insightful presentation. Your presentation certainly proves that details do matter. This webcast was brought to you by ASE and the ASE Education Foundation. For announcements about upcoming sessions, keep an eye on your email inbox. On behalf of Gordon Rye, Kelly Tran and Dan Baumhart. I'm Dave Capert, and this concludes today's webcast. We hope to see you online at another event soon. So long, everyone.